Hi there, my name's Ali and I'm back with another video, this time on the Keyed Moss Tone, which is the new synth from Laura Mel, the makers of the Double Knot, which I've already done a couple of videos on. Now the Double Knot um, is a cool West Coast uh, rhythm generator, which creates a heck of a lot of gates. So it makes sense that the next synth from Laura Mel would be a West Coast melody generator to accompany it, which is good at creating melodies from gates. Now you might wonder how that works, and it really all has to do with the keys here. Like I said, it is called the keyed moss tone. Now the moss tone is the core synth voice. Um, it is purely analog, the full signal flow. And then the keys um, are kind of attached to a digital brain, which communicates with that analog voice, um, as well as adding some interesting utility functions. Now the keys are touch plates, and like I said, they are digital, so there's no variation, uh, no pressure sensitivity or anything like that, it's just on and off switches. However, they can be very expressive and very fun to play. Um, they feel really nice, they're made of gold. And um, they really get you to think about melodies in a unique way. So I'm going to go over the keys first since I'll be using them throughout the demonstration. Now, um, let's go over the circles first, since they are sort of the heart of the key interface. Um, the three circles in the middle are sort of the, uh, the keyboard of the Moss Tone. Um, they tell the Moss Tone what note to play, and they also trigger the envelope. So when I press this key, it'll trigger that envelope, and it'll tell it to play the pitch associated with this circle. Now if I press this circle, trigger the envelope and tell it to play the pitch associated with this circle. Now the unique thing about these, these circles is that um, they work on binary logic. With these three circles, you can get eight different notes, which you can tune here with these trimmers. Currently I'm tuned to a West or a um, just intonation mixolydian scale, if you're curious. So um, for example, if I press this note, I get one note. If I press this circle, I get another note. If I press them both together, I get a third note, and so on. So we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes. Now where's that eighth one going? Now the eighth note is actually playing right now. I call it the root note. It's this one on the far left. Um, it's always playing when you're not pressing anything. The thing is you can't hear it because the envelope isn't being triggered. Now we could, of course, just patch a gate into this envelope and put here, or this envelope trigger. So I'll take this clock for the double knot, and now we hear the root note. Now, obviously that's not always practical, so we have another way to hear the root note, and that is to lengthen the decay of the envelope. Now, if I press this circle, I'm going to hear that note, but if I press and release, you hear it jump. It drops back down to the root note, since nothing's being pressed. The envelope's still falling. So you get sort of these arpeggio-like effects. It's something kind of unique to the moss tone, and it gives it a very characteristic sound, sort of arpeggio-like at times. Now, of course, you can also do this in a legato style, so if you don't want it to go back to the root note, hold this circle, and now it's going to fall back there. So you get lots of interesting sort of combination-based melodies just by learning to play these three circles. Now this rectangle here is um, the loop key. Now what this is going to do is it's going to trigger the envelope, a third way to hear that root note by the way. It's going to trigger the envelope and then it's going to loop it. Now it's doing that by internally patching the envelope trigger into the end of cycle of the envelope. So whenever the envelope ends its full cycle, it'll start over like an LFO. Of course, you can play the circles while it's looping. It's not going to re-trigger the envelope though. This is going to take over. By the way, if you have something plugged into the envelope trigger input, same thing. These are not going to trigger the envelope. These only trigger when mm -hmm. nothing else is being using used to trigger the envelope. Hopefully that makes sense. 
Okay, so um, you already have quite a few possibilities just using these three mm -hmm. plates. Now we have even more pitch possibilities using this top and bottom key. Now the top and bottom key are transpose keys, I like to call them, just because they're going to take the notes that you play and transpose them up or down a certain amount. Um, you can choose this amount with these two trim pots here. I currently have this plate set so that whenever I press this plate and hold it, it will uh, transpose up an octave and a fifth. Um, and if I press and hold this plate, it'll transpose down one octave. Um, you can choose whatever values you like. You don't even have to have this go up and this go down. It can be whatever you want. So for example, we have one note. We have an octave and a fifth up. And then we have one octave down. Now, some of you may be wondering, can you combine these two? Can you press them both at the same time? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, and you will get a third interval. So in this case, I have an octave down, and then an octave and a fifth up, and that equals one fifth. So we have theoretically 32 different notes that could be hit just with these five plates, which is pretty amazing. And it's a really clever concept. It gets even more clever when you start looking into how it patches. Anyways, um, just keep in mind, if you're going to set up these uh, two plates to be offsets of each other, for example, one octave up and then one octave down, if you press the two together, you're just going to get the normal notes. So make sure that your offsets do not add up to the same value if you want to have the maximum amount of notes or the most flexibility possible. Now finally we have this plate here. Now this plate is special because it doesn't actually, in, you know, by default do anything to the internal signal of the MOS tone. Um, you're not going to hear any effect when I press this. You have to start patching to really hear the effect of this plate, but it can be quite powerful once you do. Now this is a the random key. What it's going to do, it's going to interface with these two random outputs. Now random number one is a sample and hold. It's going to create a new random value every time you press the key. You see, just look at the light there. It's going to create a random voltage between 0 and 8 volts, which is the lower mill standard. No negatives. Don't ever patch a negative into one of these synths. Alrighty, so you get a random voltage each time you press this. Now this key, this random output, is going to create a track and hold. Now what that means, it's subtly different. When you press and hold this key, you see it's creating digital noise. Um, it's not super high frequency. Um, it's got a very digital feeling to it, but it's creating random values at a relatively fast pace. Now when you let go, it holds on the last value it was on when you let go. And then you press and it keeps going. Then you let go and it holds. So you have two interrelated random generators that should keep triggered just by one key. And that can give some really interesting and unpredictable results, especially with the double knot, which doesn't actually have um, any sort of random generator built in. So with the help of this random, you can create all sorts of cool random rhythms if you have the double knot. Now you have another option for triggering the randoms, and that is this random input here. Um, this takes a gate, and whenever anything's plugged in here, these both turn into sample and holds. There's no more track and hold functionality. But um, if you have something plugged in here, and you press and hold this, this will still create some noise. But um, it's another way of using these as random generators. But they're going to be two unique random values. They're not going to be the same. So it uh, gives an interesting la layer of uh, chaos to the instrument. And it's completely optional. Like I said, you don't actually have to use this if you don't want to. Okay, so I'm going to start looking into some patches here because I know you're probably tired of hearing, hearing me talk. Um, so I want to sh show you how Loremail does its, um, you know, does its patch cape or its inputs and outputs if you don't already know. Um, so essentially the design looks a little crazy at first, but um, if you know that if any jack is on the line, like these ones here, you know they're inputs because they're on the line. If it's off the line, like this one here, you know it's an output. It's going to put out, out signal. And if it's on the line and it's connected to a knob, um, it is going to attenuate that value or change it. Now, one more thing I should go into before I start patching is that these knobs um, all do double duty, which is something that I know some modular people are not a fan of. If you don't know what I mean by that, um, double duty means that 
when you have something plugged into one of these attenuators, instead of this knob just determining the value of that parameter, it's going to act as an attenuator for that input. So it's going to go from no change and at zero to um, you know full full value over the full control over the values. Um, some people aren't a fan of that because they say it limits options, um, but this is a tiny little modular synth. It's like the size of my hand, um, and it works really well at creating interesting patches with minimal amount of cables, and um, it can be really inspiring and fun to play with. So I don't mind it, but I thought you might want to know. Anyway, so let's go over the uh, digital side of the synth before we go over the other parts. Um, now we have those random parts I've already talked about, this input and then these two outputs. Um, now we also have a gate output. Now this gate output is going to output a high value whenever you press one of these circles. This is a pitch output and it outputs a voltage related to the pitch of the note you're playing. It is not one volt per octave. It is a very wide ranging um, Wide, wide ranging voltage, so um, you're not going to get volt per octave tracking or anything. This is more meant for creating modulation based on the pitch. So for example, I'll go ahead and connect that pitch output into this decay. I'll turn up the decay's uh, attenuation a little since this is now an attenuator. So now what that means is the higher the pitch, the um, faster the envelope is going to decay, which is just like a real life uh, acoustic instrument. So you hear you have a slow and then it's a lot faster when it's higher pitched. So this, so the higher the pitch, the faster the decay. It could be subtle, but it's kind of nice for creating sort of a more acoustic feel to the sounds. Now these, uh, I don't believe these have any effect, these up and downs, um, these don't really have any effect on the pitch CV, I don't believe. Let me check here. Yeah, they definitely don't. Anyways, so it's really just about the pitch of these keys. So um, we have a gate out here. Now we have the low bar out. This is going to output a gate whenever um, you have this held and then go back down whenever you let go of this low bar. So um, it allows some cool tonal modulations based on that bar and just adds a little bit more character and variation to your playing. So I'll take this low bar out and connect it to the wave folder so that whenever I'm pressing and holding this, we'll get some wave folding. And when I'm not, it'll be just the raw sound. So that allows some cool variation. Now, these three inputs are actually my favorite inputs on the entire synthesizer. Um, and they're, uh, when I mentioned earlier, creating gates and turning them into melodies, um, they are the key ends. Now, what they're going to do is that each of these three circles, or each of these three inputs, correspond to these three circles. So whenever this receives a gate, or any sort of high voltage, high enough voltage, um, the key will be pressed, and then whenever it goes back down, the key will be let go. Now, that may not seem too interesting, but uh, let me just show you. So we have right now a rhythm going on the double knot, slightly off camera. I'll unmute the double knot so you can hear what that rhythm sounds like. So it's kind of a shifting rhythm. Um, it's not in 4-4, four, four. It, it sort of shifts against itself. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the gates from that rhythm and use them to control these pitches. So I'll take one here and put it into this one. I'm going to unmute the double knot so you can hear the context. Already we're getting some cool, cool 
interconnected melody and rhythm. But now I'm going to take a completely other output and put it into another one of these note ends. envelope this time so this isn't a gate being sent in it's an envelope but these inputs don't really care you can send it whatever voltage is as long as it goes high high enough so you get these sort of shifting arpeggios and mel melodies that are related to the rhythm I can still press and hold the circles even if there's voltages going in. But keep in mind when you press and hold the circle, it's limiting the both the amount of gates and also the possibility of nodes. So if I press and hold these two, I'm, we only have two options for nodes. Now you can get even more variation by patching a, um, a gate into the envelope input. That's going to kind of override these gates and create uh, another sort of rhythm that's interrelated. So I will take this one here. So you can see the notes are being pressed, but it's only going to trigger a gate when the when the gate when the envelope gets triggered by this gate input. So I'll take this uh, end of cycle of the envelope and put it into the random generator. So we're getting a unique random voltage each time the envelope reaches its end. Actually, that's not working too well because the envelope's being triggered too much. So I'm going to use one of these other gates. This is the uh, rise and fall gate. So I'll do the fall gate. See, so we're getting a random value each time on both of these inputs. So I'll take that and put it somewhere else on the synth. This is the noise. So we're going to get some ryth rhythmic sounds. And this is going to affect the attack. that if I change the rhythm, it's going to change the melody.
you get the point. Anyways, so you have a lot of opportunities there. Now you can also self-patch to create melodies, um, though in my experience they're going to have to be random melodies. So I'll show you what I mean by that. By I'm, I'm going to recreate one of the patches from the manual. Um, if you haven't read the manual, I recommend checking it out. It goes over some stuff in a little more technical detail. Um, and it also has some pretty cool watercolors of the circuits. So it's kind of fun. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to keep that random setup how it was. Sorry. So what's going to happen is we will have the envelope loop as we did before. So I'm going to patch the envelope trigger into the envelope end, and now we have a looping envelope. So now we have an LFO of sorts. Ooh, I forgot to mention, I should point this out. If you press and hold the loop key, random key, you're going to get a unique random value every time the envelope uh, reaches its decay phase. So it's automatically internally patching the, um, the random input to the fall gate. So see we're going to hear the noise continues. So it's really this one that's mostly following that. Just a little quirk, forgot to mention. Anyways, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that fall gate and patch it into the random input. And I'm gonna take the envelope out, or end of envelope rather, end of cycle, and patch it into the envelope in. So we're getting a unique random value on both randoms each time the envelope loops. See all the randoms. So what I'll do now is I will take one of those randoms and I will patch it to one of the keys. bit of a random thing going on. And I'll take the other random and patch it into another one of the notes. Now in the manual, they also add a third patch here. add a third patch using this bit here. Now this bit is the inverter. Um, it is analog I believe and it is going to take the input here and invert it over the 4 volt axis. So 0 volts will become 8 volts, 8 volts will become 0 volts, everything else in between will be flipped around that axis. So um, you know what you can use that for getting you know a kind of logical knot um, or um, sort of Thing. So you can get a gate that's only going to go high when something else is low and vice versa. But in the experimentation here, what they did is they took one of the randoms, inverted it, and used that for a third voltage. So one, two... One of these circles is getting driven by random one, one of them is getting driven by random two, and then the third one is getting driven by an inverted version of one of the randoms. So you get pseudo-random for that last one. Now you can get even more variation by connecting uh, one of the one of the randoms to other parts of the set. So what I want to do is to take one of the randoms and connect it to the decay so that we get a unique decay value on each loop. This is going to change the rhythm. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. So pseudo-rhythmic, but pretty spastic. Now we could 
go further, but I think you get the idea. So you have quite a few interesting possibilities there. Okay, so that's pretty much covered the digital part of the synth. Um, pretty much everything from here on is going to be fully analog, um, but we're still going to use those other digital parts to influence those analog bits. God dang it, this is hard to do. I have a freaking tripod. <laughs> My arms are like completely apart right now. <laughs> this is not easy. Anyways. So, we have two more parts of the synth to go, really. Um, and uh, that is the envelope generator, or slope generator, and then the moss tone itself, the core of the synth. Now you may have noticed already that the moss tone has a couple uh, quirks in its sound. Um, I like to say that the moss tone sounds a lot like a wind instrument. Um, it does really good uh, imitation of wind instruments because it has an aspect of noise and then a very simple tone underneath it. Um, it has a very characteristic sound. And what I mean by that is that if you don't like what you hear in this demo, you probably won't like the moss tone. It doesn't have the widest range. Um, you know, it doesn't have a ton of options. It doesn't have a crazy Mott and Matrix. Uh, it has, you know, a very simple signal flow. So you're not going to create the most um, unique sounds from each other, but the moss tone creates a very nice tone on its own. And if you like how it sounds, uh, you can get a lot of that. Uh, However, it does have some flexibility. It also does some pretty good snares, as you were hearing, which can be a nice uh, benefit when you have the double knot working with you, um, since the double knot doesn't really have any snare capabilities um, beyond some extreme FM. Anyways, so what is the signal flow of the Moss Tone? Like I said, it's very minimal. It's a triangle oscillator. You have a triangle output here. That's just the raw triangle. Um, and that triangle oscillator is tuned with this bass tuning knob. Now this is the only knob that doesn't do double duty. Every other knob does the double duty thing where it becomes an attenuator if you plug something into it. Um, this one uh, is just gonna be a volt per octave uh, you know, pitch. Uh, there's also a volt per octave and gate on the back, by the way, if you aren't interested in the whole key thing, though I think that kind of defeats the spirit of the whole instrument. Though, interestingly, you can also plug in a melody into the volt per octave in the back and have these work as offsets, which can be fun. Anyways, I do want to clarify here what I mean by double duty in case you're not familiar. I'll take the envelope output here and pitch it into the wave folder and you'll hear... Give me one second here. You'll hear sort of... Uh, if I put this all the way to zero, that envelope is going to have no influence over the sound. You're just going to get a pure no, wa no wave folding. Now, as I turn this up, instead of this we're acting as a normal knob where it's just gonna increase the wave holding, it's going to increase the amount of influence this envelope has over it. So as I increase this, the sound is gonna become more and more plucky as the envelope has more and more say in the sound. So hopefully that explains what I mean there, just in case you don't know. Anyways, so we have the volt per octave or the pitch control, you can go super low and also ultrasonic, um, especially once you introduce some FM here. Now this FM is unlike the FM on the, um, on the double knot. Uh, it's a linear FM input, but it works in a kind of interesting way. It's a kind of a double, uh, it's kind of got double the, uh, up and down control, I, that doesn't make any sense. Basically, um, whatever you put in here, whenever you start to turn up the linear FM amount, it's going to make the sound go both higher and lower than this pitch you've tuned it to. So I'll show you just with an example here. I'll take the clock. Second here. I'll take the clock from the double knot. And I'll connect that to the linear FM. So when this is all the way down, you're not going to hear really anything. All right, I'm going to have to show you something that I've been holding off on. Mm. The envelope has two modes. It has a one-shot mode, which we've been in for the, pretty much the whole demo. Then we have a sustain mm. mode, which is going to allow you to hold and release. So it becomes from, it goes from an attack decay envelope to an attack hold release. Attack, hold, release. 
works with Legato, so. However, if you press this, it goes back to being in attack decay. Anyways, I'm going to use this just to show you the linear fab. So you hear this is the bass note we've tuned it to. And now as I turn this up, you hear it's going higher than that bass note and lower. And now you see how wide range this uh this goes. This goes into already we're into the subsonic and almost ultrasonic range as we go higher. Now you might wonder why you even would want that much range, and that has to do with how the signal flow of the MOS tone works. So anyways, we have that triangle oscillator, very wide range as you can see. Um, and then we have a bit of noise. This noise is created from a Zener diode. In the words of C. Lombardi, it um, takes, it amplifies the sound of indecisive electrons. Um, so it's a kind of interesting kind of sort of noise. It's not pure white noise. It's sort of uh, reminds you of an AM radio. So I'll start to bring in some noise there. They mix together in a saturated uh, mixer or VCA. So. So definitely not pure noise. And also notice that you can never get rid of the triangle. The triangle is always going to be there. It's the core part of the, the sound. This is basically just sprinkling in some noise as the manual puts it. Now this is the noise input, of course. And you can also get a noise output here. This is just the raw noise before the mixing. You have the triangle and the noise there. Now finally, we have the wave folder. Now the wave folder is a Lockhart wave folder um, designed by Ken Stone. Um, and uh, essentially, um, the interesting thing about this uh, is that the noise in the uh, triangle wave get mixed before the wave folder. Um, so once it's getting wave folded, it ends up affecting both together as sort of a united, um, united oscillator. Um, what that means uh, in practice is basically, if you look at this under an oscilloscope, um, whenever the triangle is in the middle, it's pure triangle. And then as it gets to the tip, uh, noise starts to color it. And the noise hangs down from the waveform, and it looks a little like Spanish moss, which is why it's called the moss tone. The noise all hangs down. Um, and the more wave folding you add, um, it starts to add these discontinuities in the waveform. Um, it doesn't get crazy like a Buchla wave folder or a Surge wave folder, um, but it adds a really interesting degree of shaping. Um, and it has a kind of very characteristic sound. This is pretty much where the heart of the moss tone sound comes from, so. So you hear a little change is happening. it's not very linear there's lots of interesting changes throughout that course of the knob and they interact interestingly with the noise as well so I'll sprinkle some noise in and then I'll move the same sweep and you'll hear how the noise kind of gets quieter and louder throughout the movement of this knob There's some interplay there. Maybe you hear what I mean about the uh, AM radio thing. Now another thing that has a big influence on how these tones interact is the pitch of the triangle. Now uh, this is at a sort of normal pitch, but when I move the pitch down, we start to get almost a uh, heavily driven sound when we start to move up the wave folding. at this under a spectrogram, by the way, and part of what gives this such a distinctive sound is that the wave folder heavily emphasizes the seventh harmonic in the harmonic series. 
um, which is kind of unusual for a wave folder. Um, I did some research on the Lockhart wave folder, by the way, and apparently it was originally invented to um, take a um, sawtooth and move it up a fifth, I think. It doesn't work at all, apparently, for its original purpose, but it sounds neat. Now, if we have the pitch down to very low pitches, um, subsonic, you get a completely new effect, um, which uh, will cause drawing seagulls. Um, essentially, it creates this really pretty effect in an oscilloscope where the noise kind of ebbs and flows as it moves up and down the triangle, which has become sort of an LFO. So you get, instead of you getting the sound of a triangle and a noise mixed, you get sort of a tremoloed noise. This creates some pretty neat motorcycle sounds. Especially once you go even slower. So I'll add something into this FM just to let you hear how that can change. So I will connect this to this. Actually, I'll just take this high voltage. That's gonna go up. So let's try connecting something else. Uh, how about this, which is currently a zero. Conveniently. So you hear that almost sounds like a, I think that sounds a lot like a brush uh, on a drum head, like on a snare drum. It'll take a while for it to start because the triangle is going so slow now, like way below LFO territory. You see what I'm, you hear what I mean about the AM radio thing now. I'll turn down the uh, wave holding to make it more. there's going to add some interesting rhythms there. So you get sort of a sense of how the moss tone sounds. Now, that is pretty much how it sounds, like I said. It's got a very unique sound, but it doesn't have a ton of tonal range. Um, so you kind of have to just work within those limits. We do have some tonal possibilities, though, um, through modulation of these parameters, um, both self-modulation and modulation outside. So, for example, just using the moss tone, I could take these triangle and noise outputs and use them for some sound shaping possibilities. So what I'll do is I'll take the triangle output and use it to modulate the pitch to this linear FM. Now this is going to create sort of a um, triangle, which will slowly become more and more sawtooth-like as the pitch lowers, and eventually it'll completely feed back itself and stop even working. Bring the pitch deck down here. You hear the waveform is changing as the pitch changes. Now, if you look at this under a oscilloscope right now, this is a lot more sawtooth-like, and it will interplay with the noise and FM differently, or noise and wave folder differently. As you see around here, it just completely dies. And then it comes back for some reason. I don't know. It's weird. Um, this FM, by the way, works sort of like the double knot FM in that it is basically working with a VCA, which clips. So around this point, and this might be why this happens, um, after this point, the voltage coming into this FM input is not going to go any higher. It's just going to start clipping like a... Um, like a distorted sound. So it's going to become more and more square-like and at full value, it's going to be become basically anything that comes into here is going to be turned into a square wave, a clip square wave, sort of.
Alrighty, and now I'll take the triangle and plug it into the wave folder. That creates some cool sounds as well. It's a little bit different, and then I'll plug it into the noise, the triangle. Was modulating the noise amount. And then we can do the same thing with the noise. Take the noise and just feed it to the FM input. And then we get some even more flute like sounds. This is a trick I like to do on a lot of synthesizers, but it works really well here. Here, as I add the noise to the linear FM, the pitch becomes more and more wide ranging, it's sort of windy in nature. It reminds me a lot of howling wind, it's kind of pretty. pretty crazy. I'll take the noise and have it modulate the wave folder. So even though it's a simple, very minimal signal flow, you have a fair bit of tone shaping possibilities. Just not a crazy amount. So that's the uh, noise modulating the amount of noise. Sort of like high pass filtering it somehow. I'm not sure how that works. Anyways, and of course you have expressive possibilities like making it so whenever the key is being held, it'll increase the amount of noise. Even better, what I like to do is I'll take the rise gate, the gate that's only high when the attack phase is on, and I'll connect that to the noise. So you get a sort of interesting pluck to the sound. And the amount of attack will have a big influence on that pluck. also like to do uh, take the envelope output connect it to the wave folder and that creates even more plucky sounds I've actually gotten kind of good at these keys but I really can't do it right now when I'm putting my arms around a tripod have to excuse me there. So even with those simple parts, you do have some interesting options with the sound of the instrument, but just make sure it's a sound that you like, because like I said, it has something unique about it, something very um, characteristic of the moss tone. Now I said it does good wind instrument sound, so I'll just show you what I mean. Just 
with a nice amount of attack and decay. Speaking of which, I should go over the last part of the synth we haven't gone over yet, which is the envelope. Apologize for not going over the sustain earlier, but basically the sustain button is going to switch between the two modes of the envelope, which is a simple attack decay, and then a attack sustain release. Now, one little quirk of the envelope is that um, these inputs are going to follow the attack sustain release method. Um, this input is just a trigger input, so this is not going to hold, but these will hold. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyways, um, so one other quirk about this slope generator. Uh, like I said, it's an attack decay. We have, this is the attack and this is the decay. Now they work opposite of each other, and that takes a second to get used to. <laughs> Basically, um, at the minimal value, this there will be no attack, and then when you turn it up all the way, you get full attack. So no attack, more full. This is the opposite. So this is full decay, and as you turn it up, you get less and less until you get just a little click. Now, there are two reasons that I can find for this. One is to create variation. Um, for example, if you send the same CV into uh, both of these, which I'll, you can do just by connecting them and then just plugging in something into one of these, um, you will get an uh, envelope which switches, which switches shape. So I'll show you what I mean, actually, because it's kind of cool. So I'll connect these two. I'll turn the knobs to about the same amount. And then I will take this clock and use it to swap the shape. So that means that whenever this clock is high, um, the envelope is going to go uh, up like that. And then when the, when the clock is low, it's going to go it's going to go down like that, like a upward ramp and then a downward ramp. I think I have that right. I might have got it backwards, but I don't care about thinking about that right now. So you'll see what I mean. I'll uh, also um, do something just to trigger the envelope. Well, actually, I'll just loop it here. You see what I mean? So it's going from a ramp to a slope down. Also, it just works sort of intuitively as well. Um, essentially, whenever uh, you... Generally, you want your decays to be long in most synth sounds, um, at least for me, and then you want the short plucks to be sort of an embellishment and the reverse you'd like for attack. Um, this also allows for another cool thing, which is if you patch the envelope output here, this is the envelope out, um, into one of these attack or decays, you will get, if you patch it into the decay, you'll get an exponential decay, um, you know, much more plucky. And if you patch it into the attack, you'll get a logarithmic attack. I actually suspect that's the main reason that Will did this, because he seems to like that trick. So here, instead of being just a straight line, it's more of a, like a circle. And the exponential is going to go from a straight line down to a sort of exponential fall. Anyways, so... That's something to get used to. It takes a little bit of getting used to, to be honest, but um, it really doesn't, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. You get used to it, and it's actually pretty intuitive once you've learned it. Now, finally, we have these. Well, this is the attack, the trigger of the envelope, and this is the um, end of slope. These two are rise and fall gates. So you see, this is uh, whenever it's in its attack phase, this is going to go high. And then whenever it's in its decay phase, this is going to go high. They're sort of inverted versions of each other. If you have sustain on, when it's in the attack phase, this and when it's in the hold phase, this will be high. This is just for the decay and release. And that's the whole synth, except for this, this little piece. Um, that's the VCA input. Now, that's something that's really fun to work with if you have other synths especially. Um, so I'll take the double knot, for example. I'll take the clock output. And I'll put it into the VCA input, that's going to override the envelope. So the envelope will be completely detached. The envelope is normaled into this input. So when I put this gate in, 
we just get the VCA opening and shutting like a gate. Alrighty. And um, last bit, this little trimmer here. This is the voltage scaling. Currently I have it set for a volt per octave. You can make it go higher or lower if you'd like. Um, and you can even get wider ranges of the keys here because these are based on the scaling here. So that's the whole synth actually. Um, it's very minimal. It works really well on its own and it also works even better with another synth, especially a rhythmic one like the double nod. Um, I'll do a little bit of experimentation. I actually have to go in a second. So um, I won't be able to show too much, but I'll just play around with the double knot and the moss tone just to show you what it's capable of. I'm gonna unmute the uh, double knot now. Let me just make a... One of the envelopes from the double knot, one of the envelope outs, and patch it into. So now the envelope from one of these drums, per se, is um, triggering the VCA, or is controlling the VCA. So they're sort of connected. I like to do that. It creates some cool drum sounds to the other envelope. oscillators from the double knot and I'm going to use that oscillator to modulate the FM input of the moss tone. This is going to create some really interesting FM timbres. this uh, pitch output to modulate the decay length of one of the drums.
<laughs> okay, you get the idea. So you have quite a lot of fun stuff you can do. Now I do have to go, but I will make more videos on the moss tone. Now this is just an overview to show you how the moss tone works. I hope it was helpful. One last thing I want to show before I go actually. This thing can be quite pretty, as well as crazy. I'll show you what I mean. I'll add some reverb. Just real quick before I go. Adding in the reverb now. You get the idea. <laughs> Have a nice day.